when we went to our 20 week ultrasound, we were so excited to get to meet our baby. Um, it had been a really long and hard journey for us to get pregnant and we were just thrilled that we were gonna get to see a picture of our baby. And um, at that time, the most exciting thing we were trying to figure out was if we were going to find out if it was a boy or a girl. And we decided that we were gonna be surprised. Um, and that day, um, we were definitely surprised, um, but the gender was the least of it. Uh, so we sat down and the doctor started to introduce um, some concerns for baby spark, as we had nicknamed it. Um, some things that came up were uh, genetic abnormalities or um, wasn't growing as it should be. We just sat down and we held hands and we prayed. Mm -hmm. When we were sitting there in the lobby, I was reminded of a song that I had been rehearsing for, for the church service that coming Sunday, and it was the lyrics of the song were, I am no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. He just looked at me and said, I feel like our baby is telling us, I am a child of God. And um, that was the moment when things turned for me, when I realized um, this wasn't just about us. It wasn't even just about our baby. It was about what God is doing in this story. And um, no matter what happened, if our baby was healthy or not, if our baby made it to full term or not, whatever the outcome was, we knew that God was with us and he wasn't going You know, I was actually thinking about trying to lip sync that as I came up here, but I didn't think that was eventually going to be a good idea. It's the most wonderful time of the year with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Question, who made that song famous? Who was the voice? Andy Williams. Andy Williams. Very good. Do you know what year he made that song famous? First recorded it in 1963 as part of his Christmas album. Now, if I ask you today, how many of you agree with Andy Williams that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year? My guess is many of you would probably raise your hands. I'd raise my hand. I love Christmas time. It's a great time of the year. But I think some of you, if I asked that question, would probably hesitate just a little because maybe... Maybe the hustle and bustle of the whole season has just sort of drained all the fun out of it for you. Or maybe this Christmas you're missing a loved one. Or maybe you're between jobs. Or maybe you've just had the flu in your house. So you might say Christmas is the most stressful time of the year. Or you might even say it's the most expensive time of the year. But you're not quite sure you'd say wonderful. But I think we could all probably agree that Christmas is the most powerful time of the year. Here's what I mean. Christmas has great economic power in our culture, has power to make us buy things. Did you know that one quarter, 25% of all personal spending in the U.S. happens during this season of the year? Christmas has great social power. Uh, we go to parties and gatherings at this time of year. 70% of all Americans will go to at least one Christmas party at a friend's home. And 50% of us will go to an office Christmas party. Christmas also has emotional power. For many, it's a joy-filled season of celebration. But for others, and some of you are here, it can be a season of sadness or loneliness for some reason. So we can debate how wonderful it is, how happy it is, but I think Christmas is definitely the most powerful season of the year. We're in the third week of our Advent series that we have called this year simply With. And that title comes to us from the title given to Jesus in the Gospels. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And so far we've looked at the promise of Emmanuel. Last week we looked at the, 
at the presence of Emmanuel, and today we look at the power of Emmanuel. So listen as I read again for us the well-known words of Luke chapter 2. Luke writes, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Well-known words. What we want to take from it today, first of all, is the power of Emmanuel, which is the power of humility. That's where we begin today, the power of humility. The couple in the video we saw moments ago was Dan and Stephanie Rishi. And just to finish their story, uh, they have a beautiful and healthy little baby boy named Graham. And so we rejoice with them at that good news that came toward the the end of the summer. But their story is a powerful one. Now, when the time came for our first child to be born, uh, I thought I was well prepared for that event. I mean, we had taken time to prepare the nursery room in our home. We had, I'd put together a crib. We had a changing table, put the wallpaper up, you know, had a rocking chair, went to Lamaze classes, you know, to learn all those cool breathing techniques that, that for no apparent reason, it's like completely forgot them when it came time to actually do them. But I was ready to become a dad. But I soon discovered I was not so well prepared, somewhat unprepared for two realities, two things. First, I was unprepared for what a real, freshly hatched, newborn human being actually looks like. (laughs) When our son was born, he was uh, an alarming shade of blue, and his head, whoa, his head was pushed out of shape. I mean, like way out of shape. And I thought, my first thought was, holy smokes, we've given birth to an alien lizard. I found out pretty soon that that was relatively normal. But what I was most unprepared for, I think, was the power of that eight pound, two ounce lump of flesh to change my world to change my world. Because a baby has the power to change your economic priorities, has the power to change your sleep patterns, has the power to change your perspective on almost everything, and most of all, has the power to change your heart. And so it is with the child we read about in this story. Luke tells us in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Some translations say taxed, and it's really the same thing. Now, we've all heard this story from a Charlie Brown Christmas on. We've heard the story. And sometimes we hear it like, blah, 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 Jesus is born, let's go open presents. But today I want you to try to hear the power of, of the story, specifically the power of a newborn baby to invade history, to change history, to change the world. Notice the historical detail. Luke begins with Caesar Augustus. Now, history tells us that Caesar Augustus was the great nephew of Julius Caesar and eventually became the adopted son of Julius Caesar, which was how he eventually came to power. He was known as Octavian until the Roman Senate conferred him the name Augustus, which means exalted one, and made him the first true emperor of Rome in 27 BC. Now, Augustus, historians tell us, was responsible for guiding Rome into what is called the Pax Romana, uh, almost two centuries of relative peace and prosperity in the Roman Empire, one of the greatest and most powerful civilizations in the history of the world. And he funded his empire through taxation. And in order to tax the world, he had to regularly order a new census. And he did so every 14 years. And that's what's going on in Luke chapter 2. Now, Augustus was a man so great, so powerful, he actually named a month of the calendar after himself. 
which is why we call it August. Did you know that? I didn't know that before I did this study. That's why we have the month August after this man. And upon his death in AD 14, he was declared by the Roman Senate to be a god. Caesar Augustus. Next, Luke tells us, no, so Luke wants us to know that the entire story is set in motion by a pagan emperor who believed himself so great that he was a god. It's kind of ironic. Luke tells us then, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, who was this guy, Quirinius? We know from history that Quirinius was a career Roman politician who had once been tutor of the grandson of Caesar Augustus, which is how he was eventually appointed as a favor to be the governor of Syria. His life is actually mentioned by the Roman historian Tacitus. And the only reason he's mentioned in the Bible is that Luke is anchoring the story in the story of history, in real history. Now notice the geographic detail of the story. Luke says, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. That little word up is significant. The journey from Nazareth of Galilee, which is to the north of Israel, to Bethlehem of Judea in the south of Israel was about a 90-mile trip by walking. And the last portion of that journey was a steep climb from Jericho, one of the lowest cities on the face of the earth, up to Bethlehem. So Luke says they went up. So there's a reason for the up. And it's geographical. All this detail to say God's coming into the world was not imaginary, was not mythological, but was real history and took place in real time in a real place. And this is the power of Emmanuel, the God who is with us. But there's more. In verse 7 we read, And she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Now, we hear the word manger in our culture all these centuries later, and we think of kind of a cute little wooden box, like a little wooden ancient crib, like a bassinet. Not exactly. A manger was an animal feeding trough. When's the last time you saw an actual real in-use barnyard feeding trough? Not exactly hygienic. All you moms out there, Is that your first choice where you're going to put your newborn child? I don't think so. Seems to me you would only put your newborn baby in a feeding trough if that was the only option available to keep them safe. So the story goes from Caesar Augustus, most powerful man in the known world, a man who thought of himself as a god, to Quirinius, who's a local political authority beneath the level of Caesar, to Joseph, who's not even a Roman citizen, but rather an average, everyday Jewish tradesman, to Mary, who's a teenage mother with almost no status in her own culture, to a baby, born the normal way through pain, tears, blood, kind of blue, head pushed out of shape, laid in an animal feeding trough, so small and vulnerable he cannot even feed himself. And yet, it's the baby who is the power of the story. Emmanuel, Jesus, has the power to invade, to interrupt all of history, but not with the traditional power of politics or military, but with the power of humility. The Apostle Paul reflects on this in Philippians chapter 2 when he writes, Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now here's the power of humility. That little blob of human flesh lying in an animal feeding trough, became the man on the cross, and the man on the cross has the power to save, which is the second thing we look at today, the power to save. I'm sure most of you saw a few weeks ago the news that popped up uh, that Charles Manson died in a prison hospital at the age of 83. You probably weren't expecting to hear the name Charles Manson today in a Christmas sermon. 
He was, of course, was one of the most famous or infamous criminals in all of American history, and there's no need to dwell on his sordid story today. But do you know the story of Charles Tex Watson? Okay, Charles Watson was a 23-year-old college dropout and a member of the so-called Manson family who participated in the murders of seven people, at least seven people, in 1969. He was convicted, along with the rest of that gang, sentenced to death. But that sentence in California was commuted to life in prison when they eliminated the death penalty. Now, you would think that would have been the end of the sad, drug-addled, and violent life of Charles Tex Watson. But it wasn't. Because Charles Watson heard the gospel in prison in 1975 and surrendered his life to Christ. And for the last 42 years, he's led a prison ministry called Abounding in Love. He eventually wrote a book entitled, Will You Die for Me?, which is the personal story of how Jesus transformed his life. He became an ordained minister in 1981 and serves as a pastor today in prison. If you check out his website, you'll find he accepts full responsibility for his crimes as well as the punishment determined by the state of California. He's been denied parole 17 times, most recently in 2016, and he knows he'll likely die in prison. In his own words, he writes, my identity has shifted from that of a murderer to a child of God. I no longer allow my crimes to identify who I am. I see myself as God sees me, a new creation in Christ. Now, obviously, I don't know Charles Watson from anybody. I've just read about him. And there are many, many people who are rightfully skeptical of murderers who suddenly find religion on death row. But I do know this. The Bible says Jesus has the power to save. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. But as he, Joseph, considered these things, figuring out how to be- break his betrothal to Mary, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think you'd all agree we live in a very interesting time in America. And I say this not just because of the political climate, although that's certainly part of it. I say that because... The news cycle in our culture today is being dominated by a kind of national referendum on sin. Now, it's not called that. No one calls it that. But that's what most of the news is about, right? The relentless accusations of sexual misconduct. The relentless accusations of political misconduct. The relentless accusations of racism or sexism or any kind of ism. It seems that everybody is outraged about something. Isn't that true? In fact, if you're not outraged about the right things, then people are outraged about your lack of outrage, and it's hard to even keep track of who's outraged anymore. We live in a culture of outrage. And more specifically, everyone is outraged about someone else's sin. You never see a press conference where some guy goes, you know, I'm holding this press conference just to tell the whole world how messed up I am. I'm just, I'm just, I'm selfish. I'm, I have lust. I'm just, I I just need the world to know. No, we have press conferences to point out somebody else's sin. Now, there are things happening in our world that should cause outrage. We should be outraged about sexual assault, about mass shootings, about trafficking of children, about the violence of terrorism, Something is wrong. Something is broken in the world. And in the face of all this, the prevailing hope or gospel of our culture is we need more and better laws. We need better government. We need better leaders. We need more education. We need more tolerance. And all that sounds good and in some ways may be at least somewhat true. But really, will better laws fix the brokenness of this world? And what if we shift our eyes from the world around us to the world that is within us? If we look at the world within, we find out there's something broken inside there too. Regret, remorse, 
guilt over words spoken, over words unspoken, relationships broken. I was watching last Sunday night, 60 Minutes, you might have been watching too, they're doing a 50-year celebration of that television show. And they wrapped up with a little clip from the late Andy Rooney, you know, the grumpy old man always complaining about everything. And this is a portion of his little clip right at the end of 60 Minutes last week. He said, it wouldn't hurt if we could improve certain parts of what we're like and how we behave. Maybe the drug companies can come up with a pill that would cure us of the evil in our nature. Things like hate, jealousy, dishonesty, selfishness. I thought, hmm. Andy Rooney sees the problem, but there's not a pill for that. See, the message of Christmas is not we can make the world a better place if we all just try a little harder. It's not we can rid the world of evil and violence if we make better laws, have better government, and better education. The coming of Jesus means exactly the opposite. Christmas means that we collectively are so lost, so unable to save ourselves, that nothing less than the death of the Son of God can save us. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the power of Emmanuel, the power of Jesus, is the power to save. And the one who has the power to save is the one who has the power to rule, the Bible says. And that's the third thing we look at today, the power to rule. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I didn't think I was not fully prepared uh, to be a parent when our first son came into the world. I wasn't prepared for the changes it would make to our lives, for my life. In particular, looking back, I was surprised at how quickly my position, my authority, my power as father would be challenged. So by the time our firstborn was two years old, he pretty much ran the show. And if you're a parent, you, you probably understand what I'm talking about. For example, if he woke up at 2 a.m. and was thirsty, he would just cry out in the night, juice, juice. And I would hear that and wake up, and I'd be afraid that if he kept hollering juice, he was going to wake up his baby brother that was in the next room. And then that little boy would start to scream, and then that would wake up my wife, and I'd have a chain reaction that I didn't really want to deal with. So I would get up and go get him some apple juice, because he loved apple juice, and I would bring it to his room and get him quiet, and he'd go back to sleep. In fact, he trained me so well that I started making the apple juice before I went to bed, <laughs> because I knew it was going to happen. So two in the morning, juice, I get up. Did anybody see a problem with that picture? <laughs> So eventually my wife and I talked, decided it really wasn't healthy for him or us. So I decided to put my foot down. Dad, the foot goes down, right? So the very next night, 2 a.m., juice. So I got up, went into his room, and in my most authoritative dad whisper, I said, listen, I'm going to get you the juice, but this is the last time. Because I'm not going to keep doing this. This is the last time I'm getting you juice. Do you understand? Two-year-old goes, I understand. So as I walked away thinking I got that taken care of, I took about two steps away from his bed, and he went, and a graham cracker. <laughs> I turned around, and I knew in that moment that he had me. He knew in that moment that I knew that he had me. Because if I said no... He could wail, wake up the little boy, and the chain reaction starts again. So I said, and a graham cracker. Turned around, and as I got to his door, he says, Daddy. I turned around, and all I saw was two fingers sticking up out of his bunk bed. It said, and two chocolate chips. <laughs> True story. That was the last time. Pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2. See the story of power. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. 
and all Jerusalem with them, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now this, of course, is the story of King Herod and the Magi, the mysterious wise men from far off lands to the east who have come because they've seen a star and they believe it's a sign that a new king has been born. And they travel great distances to bring their worship and their gifts to this new king. But it's really a story about power. King Herod was the puppet king of Israel. And I say puppet because he had his position so long as he kept the Romans happy because the Romans were really in charge. And so he really served the Romans. Now we need to know a couple of things about King Herod. First, King Herod liked to be called King Herod the Great. And you have to kind of wonder about a king who already has the title king who also wants to be called the Great. Seems a little like overkill to me. But he liked to be called Herod the Great. Secondly, he was known as the Builder. He invested enormous resources constructing great monuments to his own power and glory. He accomplished a great deal. Through his leadership, he created the second temple in Jerusalem. He built the great, uh, uh, great fortress of Masada. He literally moved a mountain to create the Herodium, which is a, a wonder of ancient architecture. Thirdly, he was insanely jealous of his power and position. We know he had at least three of his sons and one of his ten wives executed when he felt like they threatened his position or challenged his position. So when these strange visitors come asking the question, where is he who was born king of the Jews, it makes perfect sense that Herod was troubled. And that's an understatement. And all Jerusalem with him. Why? He was troubled because these visitors, if they were right, and if a new king had been born, then his position, which he only held by the grace of the Romans, was in jeopardy. His authority was being threatened. His kingship was threatened. And so all Jerusalem was troubled because they knew that when Herod was troubled, violence was usually the result. And we know from later in the story, King Herod, in a violent rage, ordered the execution, the slaughter of every little boy two years old and under in the whole region of Bethlehem. Make no mistake, Herod was a bad guy. But Herod got this right, and that is there are only two responses to a new king. You can serve that king or you can kill that king. Herod got that right. In his little book called Hidden Christmas, Pastor Tim Keller writes, at the core of the human heart is an impulse that says, no one tells me what to do. I think that's true. At the core of the human heart is an impulse that says, no one tells me what to do. From a two-year-old who wants juice at two in the morning to an ancient king jealous of his throne, no one tells me what to do. Keller goes on to write, we do not want to serve God or our neighbor. We want them to serve us. Where is he who is born king is the most disturbing question possible to the human heart since we all want at all cost to remain on the throne of our own lives. The power of Emmanuel is this. Jesus came in the power of humility to invade human history, to invade our lives, to invade our hearts. Jesus came to save us from our sin. But Jesus doesn't just want to save us. He also wants to rule. He wants to govern our hearts, to govern our passions, to govern our priorities, to govern our relationships, to govern our lives. He wants to rule. And he wants to rule because he's king. That's the story of Emmanuel. Would you bow with me as I close? 
Lord God, once again, we thank you today for your word. We ask you to help us hear with wonder the great story of your humility. Help us to hear again with wonder of your power to save even us. And may we increasingly surrender to your rule in our hearts. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Just before the benediction, I want to remind you of the two presentations of God with us this afternoon. Hope you'll join us for the 4 o'clock or the 6 o'clock, and uh, be sure to invite a friend. We'll see you this afternoon. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of Jesus, the God who is with us, and may you know his power to save and surrender to his power to rule. Amen. Have a great day.